so we'll be starting with uh, home automation and uh, doing all of that from the lowest level at the hardware to the interface, all of that completely done with JavaScript. So uh, basically let's start with what are the components that we are going to use, like what's needed uh, for home automation. So the first thing, uh, like uh, this is a list in the order of from the electrical side to the user. So the first thing you need is uh, your controller or driver which is uh, like the wall switch that you have which you turn on and off to control your lights. So uh, in case of, yeah. So uh, when we want to do a home automation system, uh, we will need a automated solution for the switch and for that we use a power electronic switch. Uh, then we need a logic circuit uh, which can be a microcontroller board or a microprocessor board uh, which is going to drive that power electronic device. Uh, then we need a, a software interface for controlling the logic circuit which uh, could be something like Linux running on a microprocessor or it could be something like an embedded operating system. Uh, then we, uh, because your central server which is going to control all your lights and fans and everything in your house is going to be somewhere and your controlling device which could be a uh, remote or it could be an app inside your phone is going to be somewhere else so we'll need a server client interface uh, and then finally the user interface through which uh, you're going to control it. it could be via buttons it could be voice controlled. So uh, in the following example what we are going to use is uh, as a controller we are using uh, BeagleBone Black uh, so, uh, how many of you know about a BeagleBone Black? Um, how many know about Raspberry? Okay, so it's something similar to a Raspberry because everybody knows about a Raspberry. It's a microcomputer board uh, with uh, input-output pins and it runs uh, a version of Debian. Uh, to control the hardware, like the pins, the input-output pins on the BeagleBone, we are going to use something called BoneScript. Uh, I think Andrew was uh, telling about uh, Johnny 5, so it's also something like that. It's, uh, it, uh, it is a node-based uh, library, it gives you a JavaScript interface to control uh, your hardware. Uh, one uh, really nice thing about BoneScript is uh, when you are writing a program with BoneScript, it looks very much like how you uh, write a program on the Arduino IDE. It's, it has got digital read, digital write, uh, all those commands. So BoneScript was actually uh, made specifically for the BeagleBone. It can work on a lot of other boards as well. Uh, for uh, creating the API, uh, if uh, it's like a web page hosted on the BeagleBone, it, you can use socket.io or you can use a express-based uh, REST API. And uh, right, uh, for the Final user interface, uh, if, you, if you want to do it with JavaScript, one of the good uh, MVC controllers are AngularJS. So uh, before we go to uh, actually performing this, uh, let's uh, check out something important. Uh, like uh, you have this thing, uh, a BeagleBone which runs on 3.3 volt, a few amperes of current, and you're actually going to control devices which run on 220 volt and lots of amperes of current. So uh, the basic device that we use uh, are called relay switches, if you have heard of them. Uh, or uh, as a general term, we have power electronic devices. So uh, you are controlling uh, uh, some things, uh, examples are like uh, DJT, which is a transistor, uh, MOSFET, TRIAC, DIAC. So uh, let's show a quick animation on how this thing actually works. So if you can see in this video, uh, this circuit basically here is your electronic circuit and that circuit is your electrical circuit. So uh, when your electronic circuit is, uh, gets charged, uh, it, this is actually an electromagnet which uh, pulls that latch and finishes your electrical circuit. So this is the circuit in which you have a nominal amount of current and nominal amount of voltage going on. Okay, so this circuit is going to control that and they are electrically isolated and you hope that they remain that way or else you might blow up your... Uh, controller. So this is basically how uh, any kind of an automation of a, uh, a heavy electrical uh, circuit goes on. 
In fact, if you are controlling something of the order of a few kilovolt, then you might cascade a lot of them like this. Like if you can understand, you use one, one smaller circuit to control a larger circuit, which itself controls another larger circuit. Okay. So uh, coming to how uh, bone script works, so this is a very basic example of turning on the current on one of the pins on your beagle bone. So uh, like a node library, you just require bone script. And then first of all, you select uh, the pin mode. So you do pin mode. USR0 is basically the name of the pin. So there are a lot of pins. There are channels of pins which are called P8 and P9 channels. Similarly, there are four uh, LEDs already on the board, which are USR 0, 1, 2, 3. So for example, this code, what it will do is, it is going to set the user 0 pin in output mode. You have to set it into output or input mode, depending on what you need, whether you want to uh, send current out to, out to it or you want to sense the current that's available on that. And then uh, you do a digital write, which uh, basically writes a digital signal high, something like sending a one signal, which sets uh, the current value to high on that pin. And uh, similarly, uh, what you can do is, uh, this is how you do an, in, uh, you want to read the current that is available on the pin. So like uh, here we are not using USR uh, zero because USR is basically a LED. So here uh, in this pin mode, I set input and after reading, the callback function actually prints the whatever value of current that's available on that particular pin. So uh, this is a longer script which actually blinks a LED and this uh, reads the state which if it is zero sets to one and if it is one sets back to zero. So and uh, at an interval of every 100 milliseconds. So basically this script is going to toggle an LED. So let's uh, check out a quick demo about this. Uh, this uh, visible on my camera is the board that's uh, on my table. And for example, here is the code that I would like to run. So what's it going to do is uh, set all these pins to a high value for a few seconds, two seconds. And it re restores them back to so basically these four pins are used to show the status of the data being transferred. So this is basically a bone script implementation using so uh, sockets. Uh, coming back to so this uh, is just a kind of a prototype of what we did. So why this is not uh, practically feasible is you cannot, uh, like for example, you want to do a home automation. So a user cannot uh, log into the IP address of the beagle bone and click on a script to run it. So you will obviously need to have a proper API to be able to control this. So uh, that obviously uh, you can do with uh, uh, Express. Express, uh, how many of you are familiar with? So, okay. That's like easiest way to create a REST server and something like you can do switch fan one, so you will turn on the fan, switch fan zero, you will turn off the fan, and you run the server, and then you can use this REST API from any client that you want, you can make an Android app, you can make a website, and uh, then you can just uh, simply uh, let the app uh, hit on these REST APIs. So 
let's see how that works. So, so I don't know if the URL is visible uh, till there, but uh, for example, I have posted this uh, app on the 4000 port on my Beagle and uh, if I, for example, I, let's consider I'm representing the fan of a room with one of the LEDs and I, you can see it got turned on. Then, uh, for example, I want to turn the AC on. So I switch AC, so the AC comes on. Similarly, you can turn things off. So, till now it's pretty much basic. Okay, so, I'd like to hear from somebody here, out here, what ideally would you like a home automation system to be like? I mean, you have got your uh, system in place, it can turn on things, turn off things, you can make an app with a couple of buttons, like, is that an ideal solution or would you like something better than that? Any ideas? Yeah? Jarvis. Awesome. Let's try and do that. So, turn on the light. So, I'm having a Satya Nadella moment here. Turn on the AC. Oh, the AC was already on. Turn off the AC. Okay. And so Okay, so this uh, voice automation part I have done using wit.ai. Uh, wit.ai, how many of you are familiar with? Okay, it's a nice little platform. You can set up your intents out there. Uh, basically, uh, you can record a lot of sentences, turn on the light, turn off the light, turn on the fan, turn off the fan, and like that. You maybe record 10 or 15 set of sentences, and then it automatically makes sense out of whatever you say. So next time you say turn on the heater, it will create a similar intent. It will use device name as heater. Okay. So uh, basically, this is the uh, return data that I get out of wit.ai. It's uh, intent device, on off state is off, and a device type is AC. So uh, basically, that's pretty much it. I uh, wanted to be able to show you turning on and off some real lights, but that would have needed me to set up a 200 volt setup here with a uh, PE switch. So that was not possible. So I just uh, throw it open to, to any questions. Yeah. Hey, uh, hi. Uh, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you chose uh, REST as an API for interacting with your device. Yeah. That makes sense because on your device you can run that web server which kind of listens on that port. Yeah. Do you have any alternatives to that? Because I have seen those sort of examples a lot, but is there any even lower level protocols which are available? For some embedded systems even you cannot plug a web server. Uh, that's true. Uh, the thing is uh, when you're talking of something like home automation and you want to, want to productify it, so you will need to have something like a smartphone app or you will need to have something like Jarvis. Okay, so in that case, you will have to rely on having a REST API. And uh, uh, you will have to have a proper central server somewhere in your house, which will expose that REST API. And then that will do the lower level operations. 
So at some point you will need to have a abstraction of a proper client server kind of thing because uh, your uh, client, today we are talking about smartphone apps and we are talking about uh, uh, something like web apps, but tomorrow there could be something better. I mean, you know, uh, you could have uh, watches or glasses which will find out if you are sleeping or if you are awake and they will uh, control the lights and fans of your rooms accordingly. So you will always have to have a proper segregation of the, and uh, I think the best way to do it is using sockets or using REST APIs. Yeah, uh, so have you tried integrating uh, other chips to it, like say for example NFC or like say I, I come close to my door and it automatically unlocks, like uses uh, maybe the, the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or any other such devices? Yeah, exactly. So uh, that is basically we are talking about the application layer. And uh, there is a lot of uh, possibilities out there, I mean, uh, you can uh, pair with your uh, devices to have something like uh, geolocation or uh, Bluetooth proximity, you can have a beacon installed somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think Andrew was uh, showing right now about uh, uh, Johnny 5. And in fact, I have a Johnny 5 script also, uh, it's almost not visible. Uh, so basically what I, uh, the example that I showed you turning off uh, light and fan and all that. So uh, that, uh, the exact thing is possible using a Johnny 5 server also. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're using Johnny 5, then the possibilities increase because you can uh, read a lot of sensor data also, which is connected with your uh, whatever controller board that you're using, like on a production environment, you probably not use a BeagleBone. Uh, so then there could be a lot of sensors. You can have a sensor which sensors when you're coming into a door, coming out of the door, and have thermal sense, sense whether there is a person inside or not. So the input devices obviously were not there. Like I have only shown voice and uh, like uh, clicks. Yeah, that the possibility is definitely. So there. as a whole, extending the beagle board is pretty easy with the chips. Is what you. Uh -huh. Excuse me. I'm as a whole, it's very easy to extend the beagle board with whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, the beagle devices. board obviously because it's uh, like a, it's if you take a 2012 Android phone, a beagle a beagle board has that much power. It's almost similar processor and RAM and all that stuff. So you can do a lot of stuff with the beagle board. So did you evaluate other boards as well, like pr probably Raspberry Pi or versus beagle board or, or. Uh, it depends on the kind of uh, processing that you need to do. Like uh, if you want to have a complete speech recognition server running on your board or something like that, uh, there is the Odroid and then there is PC Duino which are more powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you would not rely on an internet connection for uh, voice recognition if you want to have a completely localized environment. So yeah, you will probably have to have a more powerful board. Or maybe you might have a, something like Arduino mm -hmm. connected with a Pentium based a proper PC setup, something like that. Right? People have home servers, so you can connect that with a uh, lower powered board. Makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you think is there any security issues for using this thing? Because I still feel uh, without security, uh, it's really difficult to use this thing. So, uh, security is something, uh, I mean, it's a very relative term. So, uh, one thing that I uh, do uh, say is that I am somebody from the electronics realm and JavaScript is something I'm doing very recently. I'm not a web person. And I feel that uh, the number of layers of, uh, you put a virtualization layer, you put an interpreter layer. So every layer comes with its own set of insecurities, right? If you uh, are using a setup like this, uh, so if there is a vulnerability in a, uh, in a express server, that's automatically part of your system. So uh, when, like, I, at my college, uh, we are doing a lot of projects where we are prototyping home automation systems. Uh, we are prototyping systems where uh, lab apparatus can be automated. So uh, we usually prefer to stick to native languages. We do not prefer to do it with JavaScript. So uh, that would reduce your security. But it's like a trade-off between ease of development versus security. Yeah, but is it a challenge? It is a challenge. Uh, if, if you have a connected home, I mean, you never know your neighbor could hack into it and uh, like set fire to your home. So <laughs> that's possible. Definitely, it's possible. You can turn turn your thermostat up and poof, your home goes on fire. So that kind of stuff can happen. So uh, it is something that uh, needs to be tackled when uh, there is uh, mass usage of home automation systems. Like there are a lot of 
apartments coming up these days in the metros where all of the houses have automation systems. So it is definitely important to keep that in mind that uh, the security and because uh, something like a home automation system uh, has risk to human life. Any other questions? Thank you, Arnav.